It's confession time. Every gamer these days has what is called the shelf of shame. These are games that were bought or received and yet were never played, and sometimes they're still in their original shrink wrap. In today's video, I will show you the games on my shelf of shame and let you know why I've never played them. This is Legendary Tactics. Today there are just so many games out there demanding your time and attention, so it's not surprising that there are some games that get the short end of the stick. Today's video will take a look at the games that I have on my shelf that I have never played or at least have no memory of playing. We will take a look at what the game involves, mainly by reading the description on BoardGameGeek.com as I've never played them, take a look at the components, and then take a look at why I haven't played it yet. There are 15 of these, which coincidentally seems like a nice round number. So, in no particular order, here we go. Game number one is Cities by Z-Man Games, whose designer Martin F. seems to literally scream his name in print on the cover. His name's almost bigger than the game's title, in fact. I'm pretty sure that my legendary tactics colleague Flash was getting rid of this one almost 10 years ago, and I became the recipient. We might have tried to play this one at some point way back when, but I don't have any memory of it. Cities is apparently a tile-laying game, similar in a way to Carcassonne, where each player builds their city with the goal of making it attractive to tourists who have meeples that can be moved around to achieve an optimal score. Why haven't I played it? Well, at least part of it is the aesthetics of the box itself. Bright yellow box with a nondescript image of a city doesn't seem compelling to me. The back of the box doesn't make it look like a fun or interesting game at all. I also am not a massive fan of what are called filler games as I generally find them too light to be compelling, but I will probably break it out at some point as I don't really have anything else against it otherwise. Number 2 is Billionaire by Parker Brothers. This was definitely one I got from Flash after he bought like a hundred games in one batch from some guy online so he could get a few titles he wanted and beef up his collection for his family cottage. Billionaire is one of those games that screams 1980s. The game's theme of material wealth, corporate investments, mergers and acquisitions, all centered around a juicy but mostly luck-based core. I have visions of a knockoff version of Monopoly combined with Stock Ticker, an endless game of roll and move that carries on past anyone caring. It was games like these that drove me to seek solace in the welcoming arms of the Avalon Hill Gaming Company. I was a bit surprised to see that it was actually published in 1973, and that it's apparently a modification and reheating of a game I've never heard of called Landslide. Other than that, it seems to be exactly what I had suspected it to be. And please understand, I fully appreciate the irony that I am spending time to present the games on my shelf that I have never played, or have no memory of playing, when I could have used this time to actually play the games in question. However, I feel that my recognition of this irony is enough, and I think you should too. Number 3 is Conspiracy by Milton Bradley. This one was part of that same haul that brought in Billionaire. This is a game that also came out in 1973, and it's basically a game where players compete to bribe a group of spies to swipe a briefcase and get it to their capital city. Secret payoffs, maneuvering, bluffing, and guesswork are the keys to this game. My view is that this is a game of interesting theme but less than compelling gameplay, and the tepid reviews on BoardGameGeek have not done anything to challenge my initial thinking. There's no luck at least, but that alone is not compelling enough for me to get it to the table somewhere. Number 4 is Catopoly. Now, I'm one of those rare gamers of exquisite taste and discernment who actually likes playing the game Monopoly, provided it's according to the actual rules, no house rules, and you're playing with people who know how trading is supposed to work. But all the themed versions of the game drive me absolutely nuts. Catopoly? Of all the awkward and frankly bizarre reskins of this game, this is at once the cutest and silliest for sure but I just can't bring myself to play anything other than the original game. That's why it's still in the shrink wrap to this day and I honestly don't even know where it came from. If you know of any other strange Monopoly versions or would like to confess about what games are on your shelf of shame, please post them in the comments section below. And while you're there, please give this video a like as it really helps out our channel. Number 5 is Moscow 1941, The Enemy at the Gates by SBI. I was doing the math, I think I got this game 25 years ago, but I have no memory of where. A garage sale maybe? Anyway, I remember trying to set this one up and I got bogged down with all the counters and organizational charts. This is a hex encounter game in the traditional sense. 
It's a simulation at the operational level of the German attempts to capture Moscow in World War II. It scales at 10 kilometers a hex and four day turns. It's interesting that the game page on BoardGameGeek.com has no video reviews or articles of any kind on it. My suspicion is that it is a game published at a time when similar titles simply crowded it out. I'm open to play it, provided that I've got a willing opponent as the game is reported to last between four to six hours. I just don't know if I'll find a willing opponent. Number six is Knights of the Air by Avalon Hill. This is a game that attempts to recreate World War I air combat in stunning detail. You can choose from different missions and many different airplanes of the time. All the classic maneuvers are here and the idea was to give you a really good sense of what it was like to fly these machines in the early days of flight. I am pretty sure I did try this one out to learn it, but I'm also pretty sure it wasn't played against anyone. The playing cards were cool at the time, but there was one rule that really put me off. That was Combat Fire Rule 1A and 1B, where it states that you could only shoot at your enemy in either of the final two positions of your move. Why? If you're executing an Immelman, I get that, but what about a simple straight maneuver or a turn or a jink? It never made any sense to me. I'm sure there was a good game reason for it, but it really put me off as it felt like you have to bend over backwards just to fire on your enemy. And this is not to mention that the rules are quite convoluted. The game just doesn't convey the sense of zooming among the clouds any more than a class on the physics of aviation does. Number seven is Kasserine Pass. Cax gave this to me years ago and I think I opened the box to take a look inside only once. It just seemed like a bland and uninspired hex encounter game which I wasn't into at the time. The game recreates the German attack in Tunisia in February of 1943. Reportedly, artillery is key here, but this battle is a fast-moving conflict in the mountains with a simple and playable system. But it just looks so uninspired and uninspiring. This isn't a big budget game, obviously. The pure yellow box with black writing alone gives that away. But I have nothing against it for that, and I even have an interest in the North African theater. But it will take a determined effort to get this to the table amongst all the available competition. Number eight is Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective, the Jack the Ripper and West End Adventures Edition. No idea why I haven't played it. I know I got it as a gift, perhaps from Flash. And I like the original. There's lots of reading, but the concept is amazing. I've meant to take this out every Christmas break for the last number of years, but never did. The game does fictionalize a story based on real life events, namely the horrific murders that took place in London over 100 years ago. Some reviews have said that the subject matter is a bit distasteful, but I'm open to the experience. The components look great, and I know the game is intriguing, though a lot of work to play. I'll have to make a real effort with this one. Number nine is Descent Journeys in the Dark. This one is on what has become a permanent loan from a friend of mine. I have opened the box on this one a few times, but mainly to play with my kids as a Dungeons and Dragons type adventure where no game rules were followed. It was like we were playing with toys instead of a board game. The game itself is a dungeon crawler with mechanics that are similar to Star Wars Imperial Assault, which I had already learned and played before. One person is the dungeon or game master and the others are characters exploring the subterranean world. I have played Gloomhaven a number of times and I like the dungeon crawler game as a concept, but I haven't given this one a go yet. Perhaps I could approach some friends that play Dungeons and Dragons and see if they would like to fire it up with me. I've never played a lot of role-playing games, so Descent actually looks like a great compromise between board games and RPGs. The time commitment is a little daunting as you have to play through a number of scenarios in order to get the full benefit of what the designers are creating here. But maybe if we are still inspired after we finish the Gloomhaven Digital Edition, this will be another way to scratch that itch. Number 10 is Sleuth. I've never been a massive fan of deduction games, and this one from an aesthetic standpoint looks pretty drab. I don't think it's a complicated game. There's one jewel card that is hidden away as the missing piece and you have to use deduction and process of elimination to figure out which one it is by playing cards that give you and the table in general clues. I have always kind of liked the cover on this one though and the game is a little more intriguing now that I know it is a Sid Saxon design. I just can't get myself excited about giving this one a try. It just looks like a game of Clue without the chrome to give it some visual interest. Number 11 is Archipelago. This one had a great review on Shut Up and Sit Down, and I was able to get a copy on Kijiji. 
However, this was in March of 2020 when the lockdowns in my area began, and so I was never able to get my game group together since to give it a go. I know Archipelago has a bit of a controversial theme, but I'm intrigued by the design. I've heard that it can be an amazing gaming experience, but that it can also be problematic. It's probably a game that requires commitment from the players around the table to make it work, especially since I've heard it can go quite long. Number 12 is Avalon Hill's Titan. A friend of mine lent me Titan around 20 years ago, and it still sits on my shelf. The game involves a massive battle between fantastical creatures, kind of like a mythical and epic battle royale. But I've heard, even from fans of the game, that it can be quite long and luck-filled. The components themselves look quite garish, and I'm not a fan of the aesthetic, to be honest. And there doesn't seem to be much in the way of strategic depth, so I think this one will always be hard to get to the table. Number 13 is Explorium, a high-stakes mining extravaganza. There was a time when myself and the other two members of Legendary Tactics used to buy games for each other that we found in the bargain bin at our favorite local game stores. While fun in concept, the problem is that games received this way lack the impetus to actually make it to the table. Explorium is one of those games. Explorium is a game that looks at exploration and mining. Players dig for not only gold, but copper and silver as well. Of course, there is a market to sell to and prices fluctuate, not to mention that competitors are looking to threaten your mining projects with mergers and acquisitions. It all sounds very exciting. Overall, when I opened the game, which feels a little bit on the cheaper side, the game looks really fiddly. I had read a few reviews back when I initially received it, and apparently there's a fair bit of luck to the game as well, which always puts me off. Again, this is a game that faces a lot of competition to get to the table, and I just don't see it happening anytime soon. Number 14 is Scarab Lords. Scarab Lords is another game that I received in that same cheap novelty gift era of my friendship with the guys. I think it looks nice, and it has something to do with kingdoms in Egypt battling it out for supremacy of the region, but it is handled in a very abstract way and incorporates some of the mystical. The components seem to be of good quality for a filler game, and the aesthetic is perfectly fine. I've even brought this game along to a few gaming sessions, but it just never made the cut. I've read the rules through a couple times in preparation for said gaming nights, and it seems like a pretty straightforward game with a twist or two to keep it interesting. And last but not least, number 15 is First Train to Nuremberg. First Train to Nuremberg is obviously a pickup and delivery train game. I certainly didn't know anything about Martin Wallace when I received the game, presumably another bargain bin selection from one of my colleagues. The game involves delivering goods, transporting passengers, and dealing with land rights, and is apparently based on a historical situation that occurred a couple of hundred years ago. The aesthetics of the game are frankly superb. The box art is nice, the game art is well done, the boards are good quality, and there is a ton of wooden pieces that any Euro gamer would love. But I just haven't had a chance to get it to the table. The rules seem a bit finicky for some reason, and the gameplay doesn't seem that compelling, but I could be entirely wrong here. Of all the games on my shelf of shame, this is one that I actually do want to get to the table first. What unopened games do you have on your shelf? Let us know in the comments section below. And while you're down there, don't forget to leave us a like as it helps us out with bringing more great content to you. These are the games that are on my shelf of shame. Perhaps some of them you know, and probably most of them you've never heard of. Maybe one day I'll actually break these out and give them a spin. If I do, I'll let you know right here. Thank you for watching. This is Legendary Tactics.